episode 5 of Join the Pod. Today it's just Morgan and me hosting the episode as Maria and Cynthia are both very busy with their PhDs. So today we are putting the spotlight on the harbour porpoise. Um, this, so the harbour, this is, um, sorry one second. Uh, so, all about the harbour porpoise. This is a shy species that can be difficult to spot and people often confuse it with dolphins. For these reasons, it doesn't always get the attention it deserves. However, as Ireland and Europe's most common cetacean, the harbour porpoise is a keystone species in our marine environments. And we are really excited today to talk about all things harbour porpoise. Thank you, Fiona. So I'm going to jump straight away with the introduction of the speakers. Uh, so first up, you already know her, it's going to be Fiona. Uh, so Fiona is a PhD student here in Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, uh, soon to be the Atlantic Technical University. Uh, her st research focus on the harbour purpose in the Rockabill to Dalkia SAC in Ireland's East Coast. She is using both visual and acoustic data to further understand the harbour purpose in this habitat. Uh, Fiona completed a master's degree in conservation behavior in GMIT as well in 2019, during which she investigated the acoustic behavior of harbor porpoise in Dublin Bay in relation to dredging activity. She has experience uh, as an MMO and PAM operator, and she graduated from University College Dublin in 2017 with a zoology and cell biology bachelor degree. Next up, we will have Helen. Uh, Helen is a second-year PhD student at the Scottish Association for Marine uh, Science, studying harbour purpose fine-scale habitat use around Scotland. So by using passive acoustic data collected over the past 10 years, she will look at differences in the presence of harbour purposes around Scotland, and she also hopes to gain a greater understanding of what detections on a single point mooring really mean by using passive acoustics to quantify the movement behaviour of purposes through fine-scale arrays. I'm sure we'll have uh, more information about all of these things during her talks. Uh, before starting her PhD, uh, Helen worked as a research assistant at the Sea Mammal Research Unit on two different projects studying harbor purposes and harbor seals. And finally, last but not least, we will have Cara, uh, Dr. Cara Gallagher. Gallagher. She's an ecological modeler uh, interested in how energy shapes patterns in ecology and influences species. Uh, uh, risk under human disturbance. Uh, Cara is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Potsdam, where she is modeling the role of energetics in the emergence of population and community dynamics using physiological theory and agent-based modeling. In 2021, she completed her PhD in biosense at Aarhus University in Denmark, where research focused on modeling the energetics and population dynamics of harbor purposes. So that's also something we're going to hear about today. Uh, before beginning her PhD, Cara completed a master's degree in ecology, evolution, and conservation at San Francisco State University and a bachelor's degree uh, in biological science at California State University. So if we have a quick look at today's program, um, it's going to be first up, as we mentioned, Fiona with our Ireland's harbour purpose capital, it's a question mark, uh, assessing habitat use in Dublin's coastal waters using visual data. Then we will have Helen with unlocking the enigma of harbour purposes through passive acoustic monitoring. And finally, we will have Cara with simulations using models to understand how purpose populations are impacted by human disturbance. Um, as a reminder, or for everyone that is new here, we are trying to make this the most interactive we can. So if you have questions during the talks, uh, please feel free to pop the questions in the chat. And at the end of the session, we'll have our presenters live with us for the Q&A, and we'll try to answer the question then. And yeah, I think without further ado, we can jump with the first speaker, which is Fiona. Good luck. Hi, everyone. Today, I am going to talk about the harbour porpoise in Dublin's coastal waters and how I'm using visual data to study them. So the harbour porpoise, capital of Ireland, assessing habitat use in Dublin's coastal waters using visual data. However, first I want to begin by introducing the harbour porpoise in case anyone is watching who isn't familiar with this species. All right, let's dive into it. Cetaceans, by which we mean whales and dolphins, are grouped into odontocetes, those that have teeth, and mysticetes, those that have baleen plates. 
baleen plates uh, are made of keratin and they hang from the upper jaw of these animals. So here we can see a blue whale feeding and you can see the baleen plates hanging from the upper jaw. Uh, and they use this to filter feed small crustaceans and fish. In the lower image here, you can see a humpback whale. And again, you can clearly see those baleen plates. Odontocetes then uh, are those that have teeth, uh, examples of which are dolphins, such as common dolphins and killer whales and beaked whales. And it is this category that uh, porpoises fall into. So porpoise have teeth. So there are actually seven species of porpoise. We have the vaquita. So as we, as you might know, um, these are um, functionally extinct. There's only a handful of them left. Um, their habitat was the Gulf of Mexico in California. Uh, the Burmeister's porpoise, so this guy's habitat is also um, South America. The spectacled porpoise can be found also in the Southern Hemisphere again, around South America, um, and also New Zealand and Australia. Uh, the doll's porpoise, uh, he is found in the Northern Hemisphere in the Pacific Ocean. Then we have two uh, species of finless porpoise, the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise and the Yangtze finless porpoise. And then we have our harbor porpoise. So the harbor porpoise is found in the Northern Hemisphere in the east, east and west of both the North Pacific and North Atlantic. They are considered to be a coastal species. However, um, tagging studies from Greenland have shown that they can some individuals can travel thousands of kilometers across the open uh, ocean. So identifying harbor porpoise, the harbor porpoise is the only porpoise species in Irish and European waters is also our smallest cetacean. So we wouldn't, well, can't mix it up with any other porpoise. Um, differentiating it from dolphins is usually the biggest difficulty. A lot of people report them as a dolphin. So I'm going to just go through how to identify them. As I said, they are very small, so their size is a good indicator. They're between 1.4 and 1.9 meters. They have a small triangular dorsal fin and they have a short blunt um, head. Their behavior can also be used to help to identify them. They're a very timid species. They tend to swim away from boats um, and don't display those very acrobatic uh, activities that you can sometimes see from bottlenose dolphins. So here I have just a short segment, a short video to show you um, a harbor porpoise in the wild to show you what they kind of move like. So up here is where they're surfacing. It's a mother and calf pair. And as you can see, if there was even a few waves, it would be very easy to miss this species. So. Um, harbor porpoise surveys are carried out in conditions that are very calm. Otherwise, the chances of not of missing them are, are very high. Moving on now to harbor porpoise to conservation status and protection. So um, the it is class so the species as a whole is classified as of least concern by the IUCN. However, the Baltic Sea population is classified as critically endangered and the Black Sea population as endangered. Harbour porpoise are legally protected under a number of legislations and international agreements. In Ireland, for example, we had the Whale Fisheries Act in 1937. This introduced regulations for whaling by Irish vessels. Then in 1976, we had the Wildlife Act and its amendments in 2000. This prohibited hunting and injury of cetaceans and the destruction of their breeding places within Ireland's exclusive economic zone. We also have the EU Habitats Directive um, and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So under this, harbour porpoise are classified as an Annex II species. And this means that all EU member countries have to designate special areas of conservation uh, for them. Um, uh, so these SECs are areas that are of important habitat for the species and they need to be managed so that they continue to meet the ecological needs of the species that they are designated for. So I'm just going to really quickly touch on harbour porpoise threats, but I just want to highlight that each of these um, 
we could have a whole presentation or even a whole webinar for each of, dedicated to each of them. Um, so the largest, so the biggest threat to harbour porpoise worldwide is bycatch. Um, so when they are caught in fishing gear. Um, here we have an image, this is actually a doll's porpoise that is entangled in fishing gear. Um, so then we have pollution, such as chemical pollution, um, polychlorinated biphenyls um, are a really big example here. So these are known to impair reproductive uh, reproduction for many marine mammal species, including harbour porpoise. Noise pollution is also um, a big problem. So in the last few decades, there's been a huge increase in the amount of noise that humans are inputting into the marine environment. Um, and this noise comes from a huge range of activities such as shipping, seismic surveying, um, pile driving, underwater detonations, coastal marine work, um, the list goes on. And so harbour porpoise, like all cetaceans, they rely heavily on sound. So they use it for pretty much every aspect of their life. They use it for foraging, um, for socialising, for navigating. Um, and because of this, um, and makes them particularly vulnerable to this increasing noise pollution. So all of these elements can play into habitat degradation and there can be of course physical habitat degradation but even if an area is important for an animal for the uh, for species for foraging for example if there is increased human activity in the area that results in them um, say moving away from ships instead of foraging which is what they were doing before so this um this is also an example of a de degradation of that habitat all right so there are a number of different ways that you can study harbor porpoise um we can collect data visually or acoustically and you can carry out simulation modeling as well so today we're going to have examples from each of these um, visually, you can collect data for, on marine mammals by conducting watches from land, or you can do dedicated uh, boat transect surveys, um, and you can even observe uh, cetaceans from the air, air and carry out um, aerial surveys. But today, I'm going to be talking about how um, I'm using data from dedicated um, boat surveys carried out in Dublin's coastal waters. So the area of interest for my research is on Dublin's east coast in the Irish Sea, specifically the Rockable to Dalky Island Special Area of Conservation. Dublin's coastline is actually a very biodiverse area with seven other special areas of conservation and 11 special protected areas designated here, um, protecting a range of species and habitats uh, ranging from Brent geese, razorbills, grey seals, harbour seals, and habitats such as mudflats. Dublin Bay is also designated as a biosphere, so this means it's uh, recognised as an area where humans and nature connect. So TG Cahir, which is an Irish television channel, recently did a nice four-part documentary all about Dublin Bay, um, which is available to watch on their website. Since 2007, there have been five boat-based survey projects that have been conducted in Dublin's coastal waters. So um, the MPWS tendered surveys carried out by the Irish Well and Dolphin Group in 2008, 2013, 2016 and 2021. Um, the survey that was carried out in 2008, so uh, East of North County Dublin and Dublin Bay were two of eight sites that were surveyed around Ireland um, to look for important habitats for the harbour porpoise to inform what areas to designate as SACs for the species. And the area um, east of North County Dublin actually had the highest density of porpoise of all of the sites surveyed. So there was 2.03 individuals per square kilometre. Um, so then as part of the Greater Dublin Drainage Project between 2015 and 17, monthly boat-based surveys were also conducted um, and all of this amalgamates to effort during six of the last 14 years um, and 29 days of surveying efforts. 
Dublin Bay is home to Ireland's busiest port, Dublin Port, uh, and vessel traffic is the biggest anthropogenic activity here. So we can see um, here in these vessel density plots, kindly prepared by Peter Kelly from the Department of Transport, how vessel density is highest in the navigational channel, leaving Dublin Port and heading out into the Irish Sea. We can also see here that um, as the year goes on, um, that there are more vessels covering a larger area. So um, here in May and June, you can see that there is more area covered closer to the coast here. And then in July and August, again, you can see that the coverage increases um, as well. So that's just um, a nice way to see how um, traffic can change through time. So now that we have data um, across uh, years, so between 20, 2007 and now, it allows us to start to look at trends through time in the area. So the most recent survey was carried out in 2021 in the Rockabilt Dalkey Island SAC and um, a density of 0 0.83 individuals per square kilometre was estimated. This shows uh, a 46% decline in density um, compared to uh, results from the 2016 surveys and a 42% decline in density compared to the 2013 surveys. Something similar has been seen in the other special areas of conservation for harbour porpoise around Ireland, so Roaring Water Bay and Islands SAC in Cork. Um, between 2020 and 2015, uh, the density estimates saw 70% decline. So in 2020, it was 0.61 individuals per square kilometre, and in 2015, it was 2.02 individuals per square kilometre. And when we compare 2020 and 2013, um, there was a 48% decline in densities. The third SAC for Harbour Porpoise in Ireland is the Blasket Islands SAC. Um, and in 2018, uh, there was a density estimate of 0 0.28 individuals per square kilometre and compared to 2014, this is a 56% decline in uh, the density estimate. So what do these changes mean? Uh, potentially it could just mean, so harbour porpoise are a highly mobile species um, that um, very, are very adaptive to um, their environment. So it could just represent a change in their habitat use, that they are moving out of these areas to somewhere else. Um, if this is true, this um, poses the question of whether static boundary lines on a map are the right approach for protecting um, these adaptable and mobile animals. Um, or could these declines and densities represent broader scale declines? And if this were the case, is the case, um, are SACs without active management plans effective? Um, so I, for my research, I'm carrying out species distribution modelling, and hopefully this will help to shed some light on some of these questions. So all of the previously collected data that I talked about previously that have been has been um, collected in the Rockabilt Dalkey Special Area of Conservation, I'm bringing all of this together to uh, carry out species distribution modelling. So this is where a lot of information is basically brought together um, to between information on the species that we are studying and information on the environment that they're in um, to try to understand what's driving their presence here and their distribution. The variables that we input into this process are response variables. So for example, we have whether um, harbour porpoise were present or absent within an area and then we all can also look at for example how many of them were present in the area and we bring this together with predictor variables these can change spatially for example depth slope seabed roughness and distance from coast they can vary temporally for example temperature mixed layer depth chlorophyll current speed and tidal height and I'm also interested in looking at harbour porpoise presence um, in relation to vessel density. So I'm using AIS data from ships to create uh, these 
the special density variable. And I'm also going to investigate um, harbour porpoise presence and their distribution in relation to distance from the navigational channel. In terms of outcomes of this research, it will contribute to national and global knowledge of the harbour porpoise. It will inform current mitigation measures to minimise impacts on harbour purpose, particularly within Dublin Bay and the Rockaboat Stocky SAC. It will contribute to our understanding of protected areas in general and inform future management plans of the, uh, of the Rockaboat Stocky Island SAC. I want to take this opportunity as well to thank ORPS and Dublin Port Company for funding this research. I'm going to finish on my bibliography here and thank you everyone for listening. Thanks Fiona. Um, I think it was a very good introduction to purposes if we have any viewers who might not have the chance to have encouraged them yet. Uh, it's true they live very very close to us but if you don't pay attention like they are hard to see. Uh, but it's exactly as you highlighted, because they live so close to us, they're also constantly confronted to human activities. So we have to make sure we can minimize disturbance wherever and whenever we can. Uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to see what you're going to find uh, about their habitat use and the trends in this protected area that is so close to um, major human infra infrastructures like Dublin Port, for example. So yeah, good luck with it. And thank you for your talk. And now we're going to jump straight into the next one by Helen Hailey. Uh, thanks, Helen. And she's going to be talking about unlocking the enigma of harbor purpose through passive acoustic monitoring. So a new technique this time. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. I'm Helen Hailey. I'm a PhD student at the Scottish Association for Marine Science. And my PhD is looking at harbor purpose habitat use in Scotland. Now, you've heard from Fiona. Um, about harbour porpoises and about how she's going to use visual data for species distribution modelling. And now I'm going to talk to you about how we can look at harbour porpoises through passive acoustics. So the ocean is actually a really dark place. All light is absorbed within about 200 metres of the surface. So many species have evolved to use sound for foraging, navigation and communication. And sound moves five times faster in water than it does in air. So it's a really efficient method of communication. So harbour porpoises produce um, echolocation. So they produce clicks just below the blowhole here. And then they push that through their fatty lipid melon, which is just in their forehead, that attenuates out into the water and then bounces off a target, which in this case is a fish, and the echoes return to the porpoise through the fatty membrane in their chin, in their jaw, sorry, and into the ear. So when we talk about porpoise acoustics, we're talking about that echolocation signal, that clicking which they produce. So harbour porpoises emit um, characteristic narrowband high frequency clicks at a near constant rate. Um, their echolocation is highly directional, but the beam width of just 16 degrees. So you can see in this figure here that this is where the energy is produced in that porpoise um, echolocation. So in that narrow beam pointing forward and very little energy to the back. And the peak frequency of their clicks is around 130 kilohertz. So as it says, they are these high frequency clicks, much higher than any other species of marine mammals that we have in UK waters. And if you think about that directionality and that beam from a harbour porpoise, I quite like to think of it like a torch. So if you imagine the porpoise's head is the torch and that beam of torch light is like the beam of echolocation um, that a porpoise produces. Now, if we think about it in the context of other cetaceans, um, harbour porpoises are up here in the top. So they are the highest frequency of all the echolocators that we have here in the UK. So there's, like I said, is about 130 kilohertz. So up here, way above what us as humans can hear, we're about this range here. Below the harbour porpoises, we do have dolphins. You can see in this figure, a dolphin whistle and some echolocation and their clicks are broadband clicks. So you can, we can actually hear the bottom end of their clicks. Then we have the sperm whales, for example, which have 
lower frequency clicks um, that we can hear. And then the lowest in the infrasonic range, uh, we have our baleen whales like the fin whale here. Um, so our porpoises are up in the ultrasonic range, way above what we can hear. And por harbour porpoises um, produce click vocalisations. Um, so unlike dolphins, which I spoke about, which generally, not always, but generally produce clicks and whistles, generally whistles are used for communication, porpoises don't produce whistles, so they only produce these narrowband high frequency clicks. And what you can see here is a typical porpoise click. So this is a, a waveform, this is spectrum, and this is a Wigner plot. And generally, if you look at the second one, we can look at frequency, and most of the energy there is in that 130 kilohertz band. And when porpoises produce clicks during echolocation trains, when they're um, foraging, it's quite stereotyped. So what usually happens, so this is from a captive study, so they are throwing a fish into the water and seeing how the porpoises respond to that. And then this red section, we have kind of the search phase. And there's a fairly steady interclick interval. So the interclick interval, if you think about it, we have the clicks and the interclick interval is that time between one click and the other. OK, so it's quite steady in that first position, that first period. And then in the second one, we can see an orange. That's when they start to approach. And you can see that interclick interval starts to drop. So it starts to get faster. And then what you find right before prey capture, they do this terminal buzz. Um, and this foraging buzz is really um, characteristic in harbour porpoise foraging behaviour. And here is another plot, a really nice one. This is from a wild harbour porpoise um, and it had a D tag. So a D tag is a suction cup tag, which has a hydrophone, also has an accelerometer among other things. And it means that you can record wild animals once they have this tag on. And if we look at this second plot B, you can see again, a steady interclick interval. And then as they approach and start prey capture attempts, that buzz happens. So really, really, really quick. I couldn't even do it quick enough. And then you can see here from the accelerometer, these jerks. So these are the prey capture attempts that you see during this prey capture um, sequence. So very, very powerful tool, DTAG. You can get a lot of really fantastic information from them. So as well as those foraging buzzes, um, porpoises also produce communication calls. Um, and the difference between the foraging buzzes and the communication buzzes is um, kind of, you can suggest it's to do with interclick interval as well, among some other things. Um, but interclick intervals does seem to be quite important. And what you see here in, in this figure, you can see the D tag here. So that's that suction cup um, tag that we were talking about that has a hydrophone on it. Um, and this is recording a wild animal. But what we see here is um, the porpoise was in the boat. Um, and it's calling, calling, and then it goes back into the water. And then there's a calf nearby calling as well. What you see is almost like this exchange of call types. So you can see that this is clearly a contact call. Now there's still quite a lot of a lot for us to learn about um, porpoise communication, um, but studies using D tags is bringing a lot more of this to light for us, which is really exciting. So we've learned a little bit about um, harbour porpoise acoustics and the different types of clicks that they produce. And now it's time to think about um, how we can actually monitor those porpoise populations using those acoustics. So just a little brief background, we may have already gone through some of this with the other talks, but harbour porpoises are the most abundant station in the Northeast Atlantic. So we do have a population of over 400,000 animals. Um, but they are susceptible to a number of anthropogenic pressures, such as bycatch from fisheries, especially in gill nets. And that is a problem that we currently do not have a handle on. Disturbance from anthropogenic noise um, and also climate change. And we do have a requirement to monitor them. So they are protected by national and international law. We now have six SACs designated around the UK for them. Um, the one that's most relevant to my work is this one that we have here on the west coast of Scotland. So this is the Inner Hebrides and Minches SAC. Now, Fiona will have already told you a bit about line transect surveys, because um, that is data that she's using for her project. Um, 
And traditionally, marine mammal populations are monitored using line transect surveys. That's either, either vessel-based visual surveys with towed passive acoustic monitoring or aerial visual surveys. And you can see from the figure here, um, this is the most recent Northeast Atlantic wide survey that was carried out, uh, the SCANS 3 survey. And you can see that vast area was covered both from planes and from ships. Um, but these surveys, especially of this magnitude, are expensive to run. They're generally restricted to the summer months when sea conditions are favourable. Um, and they're only carried out roughly once every 10 or 11 years. So although they have this incredibly strong spatial coverage, they have really poor temporal coverage. So it's likely that kind of important trends in distribution and abundance are being missed. So then an alternative to this is to use point transit surveys using static passive acoustic monitoring. Um, so that is to passively listen to animals using devices such as C-pods or F-pods or sound traps. Um, so these have really strong temporal coverage. They can detect both at day during the daytime and at nighttime, and they're relatively inexpensive when compared to these big boat and aerial surveys. Um, but there's still quite a lot of work to be done before we can estimate density abundance from static PAM alone. So, okay, we want to record harbour porpoises. We want to know what's going on with a certain population, or we want to know what's going on. In my case, I want to know what's going on around the whole of Scotland. So we need to think about what te pound technology we want to use, what are the requirements of that technology, and what is the experimental design. So this figure um, is from Van Paris et al. 2021, um, made by NOAA, a really fantastic figure. And I just wanted to share it because it shows uh, all, all different types of passive acoustic monitoring that you could be that you could use. Now, one of the ones I'll point out here is a vessel survey. This is with the towed passive acoustic monitoring with an array. Um, uh, I won't talk about that one in too much detail, but we've already mentioned that one. Uh, drop down hydrophone. Um, there are a number of different ones you can use. And then this one here we see on the humpback whale, that's a D tag, one of these suction cup tags that records, like we saw from the some of the harbor porpoise work earlier, the acoustics. But the one I want to point out really is this one I've circled in purple, and this is the static PAM. So this is a moored um, PAM device. So this one in particular is a sound trap, and it's moored on the sea floor, and it will be out there for months at a time recording. So then comes the question, do we want to use autonomous click detectors or broadband recorders? So autonomous click detectors such as C-pods and F-pods, these don't record the full waveform, so they use the waveform characteristics to identify clicks. The clicks are detected within the range of 20 to 160 kilohertz, so they detect porpoise clicks and they also detect dolphin clicks. One caveat with dolphin clicks is though, it, at the moment we can't really tell what species of dolphin based on their clicks alone, um, although lots of clever people are working on um, special detectors to be able to do that, so fingers crossed we'll be able to in the future. And these devices only store information derived from the click waveform. So it really cuts down a lot of the processing time um, after you've retrieved the devices, so it can really streamline that for you. The broadband recorders, these record and store the full waveform, um, although sound traps do have a click detector on them as well. They're often a little bit more expensive, although technology is going in the direction which means they are more accessible. Um, and they generally are for slightly shorter duration deployments. So I think a sound trap could be in for about two months con recording continuously, whereas a C pod or F pod could be in for about four. Um, I do mention this audio moth here. So this is a small, really low cost device. Um, it doesn't quite provide the same level of, uh, of recording that you get from a sound trap, but it is uh, a more accessible option at this point. Okay, so in the case, in my case, I'm the data I'm using is from C pods and F pods. Okay, so there are some considerations both if you're using autonomous clip detectors and if you're using broadband recorders that you have to think about. So one of the things you've got to think about is the vocal behaviour of the animal. So silent animals will obviously not be recorded. Luckily, harbour porpoises echolocate fairly regularly, so we, they are a really good candidate for a static PAM. You've got to think about the source level and the frequency of the vocalisations. So if the source level, as in 
uh, is low, so this is the sound is quieter, it will be harder to detect, and higher frequencies are absorbed faster. So it means the detection area around your device will be slightly smaller for higher frequencies than it is for um, lower frequencies. You have to think about the rate at which the sounds are produced. That's important when considering density of animals. And then with echolocators, as we've already spoken about, you've got to think about the directionality, beam width of the sound and the orientation of the animal. So if you think about that beam, that torch light again, if you are facing that torch away from a recorder or the porpoise is facing away from the recorder, then it, there's not going to be a lot of information coming from that. So directionality, orientation of the animal is really important. Um, some other factors, environmental factors, ambient noise level, water temperature, pressure and salinity, these all have effects on, on how sounds move through the water. And then also the anthropogenic noise that is around too. And then another thing to consider, which isn't from the soundscape, is the fishing pressure in the area. If your area you want to put your pods down is highly fished using trawling, then it's likely that that will be trawled up. OK, so what we have now is I'm going to show you a short video clip. And what I want you to do is think about um, what you might be recording if this was if you were recording the porpoises that you see in this video. Now, it's not quite right. I have just plonked a picture of a pod in there and I'm obviously moving the camera. So you're not it's not quite right. But I just want you to think about that. Think about the porpoise movement and what kind of information you might be getting during this exchange. Look at the thing. Okay, so now I've just taken a still um, from that video. If you just think about the position of the porpoise with regard to the C pod, you can see that the porpoise is facing in this direction. So that beam um, is heading away from the pod, but you probably still would um, pick something up there. And then if we look at this screen grab, the porpoise is facing nicely at the pod. So you'd get a really lovely on axis click. So that might give us a kind of a, per a perfect porpoise click. And then if you look at this one, the porpoise has turned again, it's facing away from the pod, so you're not going to be picking up nearly as much again. So it is quite complex um, thinking about recording porpoises with their natural movement and behaviour as it is. And so to date, um, if you look at studies that have used sea pods alone, you'll find a huge amount of variation in detection rates with differences found in varying habitats at different depths, at different times of day or night, at different times of year and at small spatiotemporal scales. So there's a huge amount of variation going on. Um, and so what my project is hoping to do is to delve down into that variation um, across Scotland. So look at the spatiotemporal variation in harbour porpoise detections across Scotland. So I'm lucky enough to have access to a large amount of CPOD data. So that was echolocation click loggers that have been used all around Scotland. So I have access to the ECOMAS project, which you can see here on the East Coast in pink. So that's the East Coast Marine Mammal Acoustic Study, and that's uh, run by Marine Scotland. And so there are um, CPODs deployed at 30 sites across the East Coast, and they've, they've been recording since 2013. Now, I also have access to the Compass data set, which you can see in this kind of purpley pink here on the West Coast. And this is recording in both Scottish and Northern Irish waters. And that's been in since 2017, sorry. And then also the Samosas project, which is out on the West, the west of the Outer Hebrides. And then I also have access to the Aberdeen University um, data from the, the Lighthouse Field Station as well. So I'm really lucky to be able to have this. And what I'm hoping to do is I want to look at kind of if we're seeing differences between the east and the west coast or if there's differences if you start south and go further north, you know, what the dial and seasonal um, trends, how habitat type is affecting it, if dolphin presence is affected, because there is evidence that dolphin presence does affect porpoise presence, especially on the east coast of Scotland. And then also look at buzz currents, so those foraging or, or call types, and um, look at how that occurrence varies across 
um, across Scotland and see if we've got different different times of year are more important for potentially socialising or foraging. And what we see at the moment, sadly, I can't show you any of my data, um, but we see a huge variety of trends at different sites. So there are some increased detections at sites in autumn and winter uh, on both coasts. We see clear dial trends. Sometimes there's more detections at night, sometimes more during the day. Um, but detections do seem to be quite consistent at the same site year after year. So they do seem to be using the same sites in the same way each year. So now I'm in the modelling stage, I'm bringing in a, a lot of environmental data into, into my models to try and understand the drivers behind some of the porpoise presence that we see across Scotland. And hopefully I will sort of untangle the mystery of what is going on with porpoises around Scotland. And that will be done through passive acoustic monitoring. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I know it's a bit of a whistle stop tour through using acoustics. It is a complex subject uh, and I hope I haven't confused you more. Um, I look forward to any questions that you have and um, yeah, thank you for your time. Thanks, Helen. This was a great talk. Uh, so first we saw how to recognize purposes visually, but now we also know how they sound like. Uh, it's true that when it comes to serving such elusive species, uh, we're quite happy in the North East Atlantic that they have such a distinct and unique vocal signature. I think lots of data came out of the acoustic monitoring study, so it was very nice and even more useful if we can assess behavior from the acoustic as well. Um, yeah, it looks like you have a lot of data on your hands, but I think it's going to be very useful to see what comes out of your research for anyone looking at acoustic monitoring. Like, as you mentioned, there are a lot of things to consider. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to see what you will find and good luck with it. And yeah, I think anyone that might want to start uh, doing some acoustic might also look back at your presentations later because I think it was very, very comprehensive, like highlights of what you should consider and what you should be careful about because of course it's not the perfect perfect technique but no yeah thank you very much for this it was very interesting and yeah next up we're gonna have welcome our last speaker uh, dr cara gallagher uh, with simulations using models to understand how purpose populations are impacted by human disturbance the floor is yours cara Hello everybody, my name is Kara Gallagher and I'm here today to talk a little bit about some of the work that I did during my PhD at Aarhus University, where I was using models to predict the impacts of human disturbance on harbor porpoise populations. So generally marine mammals are faced with a variety of threats in their ecosystem related to things like climate change, fisheries bycatch and overfishing, direct exploitation and takes, industrial development, and pollution. And all of these stressors can act individually or interact to lead to the degradation or destruction of environments. And this can cause species to either abandon these areas and shift their distributions or stay and potentially face population declines. So going forward, many of these stressors are expected to only increase in coming years. Knowing this, we need effective predict predictive methods for mitigating disturbance impacts wherever possible. Prediction can be used to guide management and conservation of populations proactively by allowing for the testing of alternative management scenarios based on predictions of how organisms may respond to changes in their environment. So to do this, you can use forecasts of how stressors are predicted to change going forward, devise alternative scenarios, and then assess the relative impacts on the population of focus. But to predict, we need tools and those tools are models, but what are models? So a definition of a model can be that it's an abstraction of reality based on simplifying assumptions. So essentially it's a simplified version of a system that can be used for understanding it better or assessing how it may respond to different changes and conditions. And there are many different types of models, but the kind that we'll be focusing on today are computer models. And one type of computer model I use in my work are called agent-based models. So these are also known as individual-based models. And they're a type of complex system simulation model. 
meaning that they simulate complex systems made of individual units. And so that makes them especially well suited for modeling populations of wildlife. They have some properties which make them unique. Um, one is that since they simulate individuals specifically, individuals can differ from one another in the different traits. So things like their sex, their age, reproductive status or body condition, these can all differ between individuals. Um, also, since these models can be spatially explicit, interactions occur locally. So animals that are in, closer to each other in space are more likely to interact. They can also be equipped with rules. So that allows individuals to make adaptive and fitness seeking behaviors depending on their environmental conditions. And the environments that are incorporated can be dynamic and super high resolution, and they can take advantage of all sorts of different environmental uh, data that we have available to us. So then individuals in the model can interact with their environment depending on where they are in space and time and really pool these conditions based on their current location. Additionally, since these models proceed forward in incremental time steps, you can follow individual animals from birth all the way through death. So changes and effects that happen early on in development can lead to um, consequences that stay with an animal throughout its lifespan. And finally, these agent-based models work on the concept of emergence, where it's the interactions between individuals and their environment that derive the system level properties that emerge from the model. And then these system level properties can feed back to influence the interactions and behavior of individuals. So in these models, I am particularly interested in modeling the energetics of animals. So energetics meaning how animals take in energy from their environment and then how they use it on their different metabolic costs. And so I take a process based approach to this where their metabolisms are kind of broken up into different processes. So the first being maintenance costs, and these are just the basic costs of an animal to do things like maintain brain or immune function or cellular repair, respiration, just these basic costs that are required for survival. Thermoregulation costs, this is the amount of energy that's needed to maintain a body core body temperature. Activity, so this is just the energy that's needed for an animal to move around or for a behavior. Reproduction, costs of pregnancy, lactation and growth. So this is the amount of energy that an animal needs to mature from a young anim animal all the way up to an adult. All right, so animals need to balance the amount of energy that they take in from the environment uh, against all of the energy that they're using on these different processes. And so animals are trying to maintain this balance of taking in enough to meet their needs but if they're not able to take in enough, there might be some consequences for that. And that can either be weight loss or they can have to cut costs in some way by minimizing allocation to these different processes. So you can use these process-based models within agent-based models using an energy budget model. And so these can be used to link food availability and environment to the probability of starvation or reductions in reproductive investment. These models allow for the dynamic prioritization of metabolic processes. So if animals aren't getting enough energy in or if the conditions um, are such that they need to reduce their costs in some way, um, animals can prioritize uh, metabolic processes that are related to survival over those for like growth and reproduction, for instance. And they're formulated based on general equations, but you can use species specific parameters to uh, develop the model for a system of focus. And so you're left with something like this, where you can keep track of how much en energy an animal uses on its different metabolic processes through time. And so as, things, as the animal matures or as it becomes reproductively active, you can follow how much energy it's spending on each metabolic process. So in my work for my, for my master's and my PhD, I worked on the cetacean of the hour, the harbor porpoise. And I like porpoises for many different reasons, but one in particular is that I think they're a metabolically very interesting species. 
And that's because porpoises are a whale, but they're a very small whale. So that means they have a high body temperature that they need to maintain, but they also have a very high surface area to volume ratio. Additionally, they live in cold water, which means that together they have a lot of heat loss that they're experiencing. So thermoregulation costs could be a big deal for porpoises. They also have an extreme life history. So relative to other whales, they reach reproductive maturity young, they die relatively young, and they can have calves in successive years. So they can be simultaneously pregnant and lactating at the same time. Since porpoises are small enough to be able to be kept in aquaria, there has been some work done to measure their metabolic rates in the past, but previous estimates have been pretty controversial. Um, but recent work has found that porpoises have field metabolic rates that are about double what you would expect for a terrestrial mammal of the same size. So porpoises may have high metabolic rates relative to terrestrial mammals. And this puts porpoises at potential elevated risk of nutritional stress and maintains really high foraging rates, the requirements for high foraging rates for the species. And those have been documented in porpoises. Together, this all suggests that porpoises may be especially sensitive to disturbance. But despite this, they're an incredibly successful species. They have an extremely widespread range and they are found in waters all around the uh, Northern Hemisphere, coastal waters. And in the Kattegat and Belt Seas, where I was working for my PhD, there's an estimated number of around 40,000 porpoises in the area. Those are very seasonal species. So in these uh, northern waters, they experience wide fluctuations in the water temperature throughout the year. And they also have reproductive synchrony. So they uh, tend to calve around the same time. And if you look at this temperature variation that they experience in their environment, they, you see a mirroring occurring with their body condition. And so body condition measured as their blubber thickness, so how deep the blubber is across their body. So if you're to look throughout a year in like North Sea-ish areas, you would see that porpoises experience water temperatures anywhere from close to zero all the way up to close to 20 degrees Celsius, depending on the month. And then if you look at the blubber depth, you would see kind of this inverse pattern. So porpoises were skinniest in the months where the water temperature was the highest and then fattest in the months where the water temperature was the coldest. So at Aarhus University, there's a lot of empirical research done on this species. Um, so there are two sections that do a lot of porpoise work, looking at things like the movement, the behavior, the distributions, the energetics of porpoises. And so there's a lot of really good research coming out of Aarhus University. And I was working as part of a modeling project that was trying to take advantage of all that great data. And so the modeling project is called Deep Ponds. And deep ponds was formed out of concern that increasing offshore wind farm construction could negatively affect sensitive marine species like porpoises. And so five offshore wind farm companies came together with the goal of modeling the population level impacts of noise on harbor porpoises in the North Sea. And the goal was to use this as a tool for planning and mitigation of future construction events. So I came into Deep Ponds to implement an energy budget model that could be plugged into the existing software that had movements and all sorts of stuff in there. So the energy budget model, how it works is that at each time step, an animal can take in food from its environment if it finds food. And if it does, it can digest a portion of that and use that digested energy on the different metabolic processes in their order of importance to survival. So animals are continuously taking in energy and then expending it on their different metabolic processes. But if animals are in experiencing a deficit, they may reduce their allocation to processes like reproduction or growth, which can cause slowed growth or the loss of calves or reduced reproductive success. So the model used lots of data from the sections that um, were generating all this great porpoise data. We also were able to use some patterns for parameterizing the model related to how porpoises use energy depending on their swimming speed and depending on their body mass. 
And then we took the parameterized model and we evaluated it against a suite of additional patterns. So we had data on things like the blubber depth of porpoises, their field metabolic rates, their energy intake, all sorts of stuff that we could use to evaluate the, the model once it was completed. So once we tested the model and we were happy with it, we applied it to two applications that I'll touch on briefly. So the first was related to noise disturbance and the second environmental change. So first I'll talk about noise disturbance. For this scenario, we were interested in looking at the potential impacts of noise generated from seismic surveys on harbor porpoise populations. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with seismic surveys, how they work is they produce a very loud sound uh, in the water column that propagates through the water and then hits the seafloor. Then as it collides with the ocean sediment, their echoes are produced, which are picked up by a receiver. And so this allows for the profiling of the seafloor to understand kind of what's down there. And can, these surveys are used for things like oil and gas exploration or for surveying sites that may be useful for an offshore wind farm. And so in these seismic surveys, there's a lot of noise produced, which can sonify huge areas of the water column. And for species like porpoises that depend on sound for, for navigation, for communication, for finding food, this can be a problem. And so a lot of work has been done on porpoises to measure their imp the potential impacts of seismic surveys on them. And they found things like reduced foraging buzzes around a seismic survey site, um, increases in swimming speed away from the sound source, and potential for large displacements. So huge areas that porpoises are essentially pushed out of because the sound is so loud. And this displacement specifically is important for porpoises, which need to maybe go into these areas or past these areas to get to food resources that they need to maintain their high energetic rates. For these scenarios, we picked three different locations in the inner Danish waters and placed a, a seismic survey that was based on a real survey that had occurred in the inner Danish waters in the past. And then we looked at five different outputs related to the storage level and mortality of porpoises. Our goal was to investigate the impact of survey timing on the population. So I was interested if there was a difference in the population level impacts, if the same survey was conducted in January versus in February, for instance. So we ran the surveys in each month of the year separately to see the relative impacts on the population. And we did find a seasonal effect. So overall, we found that the surveys had a stronger effect in the fall and early winter months. And in the spring and summer, the impacts overall were lesser. So our key findings were that timing is definitely important for adequate planning of disturbance events. So by thinking about the energetic needs of species, we can plan construction around these costs to be able to mitigate impacts on their populations. And for this scenario, we found that porpoises were more se sensitive during the late summer and fall, which is the time when porpoises need to maintain a positive energy balance to be able to bulk up for those coming winter months. One thing that was interesting is that we found that this was not directly linked to population abundance in the area. So it wasn't the population effect wasn't necessarily related to how many porpoises were exposed. So this is important for regulation, which oftentimes looks at the number of exposed individuals as the metric used, which may be good in some cases, but also we found that that wasn't necessarily what contributed to the overall largest effects on the population in terms of mortality and um, effects on body condition. For in the next application, this one was inspired by the idea that climate change may affect ocean abiotic properties, such as temperature, salinity, ocean currents, and upwelling. And these can all impact the abundance and distributions of plankton, our primary producers. These impacts on the base of the food web can propagate up, ultimately affecting uh, predator species like harbor porpoises. So we wanted to focus on two different ways that uh, warming uh, climate change may impact um, porpoises food resources. One was observed decreases in adult fish length with warming temperatures. And the other was potential changes in fish distributions. So how they spatially aggregate may change as the ocean um, increases in temperature. 
And so we wanted to look at these two potential stressors. And even though they're not related to the number of fish available, they change kind of the structure of the prey field. So these both can impact porpoises, which are dependent on fish communities. So we wanna use the energy budget model to assess how the two stressors may influence porpoise movements and space use and their population dynamics. But we'll only touch on population dynamics right now. So for the scenarios, we tested five different fish lengths where fish was either decreased or increased in size. We looked at three different spatial aggregation levels. So using the same amount of fish, these fish were either spread evenly throughout the landscape or clumped tightly together into dense food aggregations. Then we looked at three different climate change levels. So either no median or a maximum amount of climate change based on future projections for the area. And what we found was that first looking at the spatial aggregation level, there was definitely an impact with environments with really densely aggregated food patches being able to support more porpoises in the model and less animals being supported in environments where food were more homogeneously distributed. Looking at fish length, we saw that as fish length increased, the population size increased, but as fish length decreased, we had a very strong population decline happening. And at the minimum fish length tested, we had total population collapse. So these are all of the results together, and we had that population that collapse occurring regardless of the spatial aggregation level tested. So we decided since that porpoises are really flexible hunters and have been shown to be able to recover after periods of low food intake, that we wanted to allow them in the model to attempt to overcompensate or compensate for this reduction in fish length by altering their ingestion rates. And so what we found is that as porpoises were able to increase their ingestion rates, they could offset this decline and ultimately maintain their population size. But there were some caveats to that that I'll talk about in just a second. So overall, we found that the changes in temperature and salinity that we put into the model didn't directly affect the energy use that was calculated by the energy budget in the model. So porpoises experience very wide ranging temperatures and salinities through their environment. So we didn't calculate a change in their overall costs due to these two um, changes in their environment. But we did find that indirect effects due to things like the changes in prey structure definitely had an impact on the predator populations. So even if the abundance of prey species remains the same, changes in prey structure could threaten uh, marine mammal populations in a changing ocean. Additionally, we found that porpoises could compensate for decreasing fish size, but they had to increase their consumption rates. And these increases were up to 20%, over 20% higher than would be predicted using methods not considering movements in energetics. So if animals are having to locate smaller fish, they also incur extra costs just for going around and trying to find those smaller fish. So this is something that's important to consider when assess assessing the impacts of changes in energy availability in an environment. All right, so to wrap up, Models can be used to weave together empirical knowledge on a species and theory into tools that can be useful for generating predictions that can ultimately help guide policy and decisions. So I wanna thank you so much for listening and thank the different groups involved with my PhD and my supervisors and the funding agencies. And I look forward to being able to answer any questions in the question and answers round. So thank you so much. Thank you, Helen, and Fiona, and Cara. And yeah, thanks, Cara, for your talk. It was so, so interesting. A very beautiful presentation also, I have to say. Um, now, I really, I think these models are, are really cool. And like, I'm not as familiar as, with this as I am with the maybe visual or acoustic monitoring the others were doing. But I think it's really nice. Uh, and the way you explain it is also what you we were saying that all the research that the conversionists, conservationists do, like um, on each of their expertise, then combining all of this in the models to be able to properly use use the data. Because like, for example, data on prison substance, we collect them for this so that at some point it's useful to 
like in in assess potential impacts on population or things like this. So, yes, yeah, super interesting. And I think it was nice that your talk came at the end like this because really ties in everything uh, well together. Uh, I think we can jump into the Q and A. What do you think, Fiona? I'm sorry, I, I had lost my headphones and I didn't realize. So, if you girls were talking to me before, I didn't hear. <laughs> sorry. No. Yeah, I think. Uh, add into the Q and A. Perfect. So we have one question for now on the chat. I think it's for Helen. Uh, but then we can jump to others, like I have questions, maybe if you have questions for each other as well, girls. So the question was from Manuel, and it is, um, how far can you detect other purposes calling uh, and terminal buses with the D tag? Can you tell apart several untagged individuals and estimate density of purposes? Or to put it in a more general way, can your mic equipped purposes be used as mobile sensors to monitor the whole purpose environment? So I suppose it would be kind of like using one of the purpose as a glider or some kind of other PAM device. What do you think? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Manuel. Um, so I haven't worked with DTAC, so I would encourage you to go and read um, some of the papers from the Danish group, the people that Kara would have been working with. Um, but in terms of using the mic equipped porpoise, it, uh, you could absolutely use it to record the soundscape and I think what would be kind of really important in this case is that you could actually look at the sounds that porpoises are likely to be perceiving themselves um, so you can kind of look at the soundscape in relation to the porpoises themselves um, in terms of other individuals um, I guess porpoise or we don't know at the moment if porpoises have kind of individually distinctive signals like say bottlenose dolphins and their signature whistles and I guess the only way you could um, look at the number of individuals around and around the tagged animal would be to look at the received level of calls on that tag but um, I don't think you could get it to density because you don't know the exact location of the animal that's recording um, but yeah, it's a really powerful tool. Um, I think it's so much cool data coming out of DTAG work and um, constantly looking forward to the new studies that are being published using DTAG. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Yeah, I think all of us, every time we see a, a tag studies, they're always so cool. Like they, it re like, of course, there are always some ethical concerns about tagging animals, but then the amount of data you get out of it is quite intense, I just like quite a lot. Um, so I think that's the only question we had in the chat. Uh, I had a question for, wait, I just lost it. No, okay, I got it again. I think it would be primarily for Fiona and Helen together. Um, did you ever come, well, in your own research or reading papers, do you get different results? from visual and acoustic monitoring? Like, let's say you monitor the same space with acoustic in the same space with visual, would you expect different results? Or how would you explain this? How would you? Any cues, girls? Uh, I think that we think we get similar, similar results. Um, I know people, for example, from hosts that do watches um, throughout the year, it would kind of coincide with what the acoustic data sets in terms of when they're there more and stuff like that. Um, what about you, Helen? Yeah, well, I, myself, I don't know, I wouldn't have um, experience with my own data, but I know that certainly you can get more detections in the acoustics than you can visually, so I think it's up to kind of, you can get as many as eight times more detections if you would have your toad acoustics alongside visual surveys. Um, but you obviously kind of miss out on some other information you get from acoustics, so they can be really complementary kind mm -hmm. of methods to use alongside each other. Okay, thanks. Uh, Manuel is saying thanks, Helen, as well, for answering the question before. Uh, I have a question for Kara. <laughs> so you said like the models are really useful to like kind of estimate how populations might react to pressures and things like this. Do you need to build like I suppose models per you did you did them in the in the Baltic, right? 
So I suppose it's kind of geographically specific, like maybe some population would be more flexible or is there when you when you kind of like go into scenarios, do you say, OK, they might change prey that like I suppose you need to have baseline data on what they eat and everything. But do you know, like, is there I don't know how to phrase it, but do you think they might do something unexpected <laughs> or they start eating something completely different than you didn't see coming and yeah, totally. So, so for the model that I was working on in during my PhD, it was definitely like it was initially developed for the Inner Danish waters, and then there's a version of it that was expanded to the whole North Sea. Um, and so that model was very much so developed for those areas, and mm -hmm. they had movements of animals for those areas. Yeah. Like an animal, a porpoise moving in the North Sea might. It, very different movements than mm -hmm. an animal in the inner Danish waters. And so those were parameterized specifically for those areas. Um, and I think like generally you have these, like the kind of core principles, the equations that go into the model, but then to really say something about a specific population, yeah. you'd really like to have as much data as possible mm -hmm. for that population. Yeah. Um, and one thing, like a, a tool that you can use in modeling that makes this a little bit, let's say, like more uh, possible <laughs> is that you can uh, do what's called a sensitivity analysis to see kind of what parameters in the model are the most sensitive or the, mm -hmm. the model is most sensitive to. And so that can give you an idea of something like, you know, the energy density of the food that the animals are eating yeah. might be something that really influences the outputs of the model. And so for that population, it's super important to make sure that you have really good data for that mm. place if you yeah. want your outputs to be more specific to the region. Yeah, kind of yeah. reinforce the importance of having really like a lot of different data collection when we want to study a population. I think it kind of maybe builds on these questions, but I don't know, like if you consider that, as you mentioned, like the porpoises are very, like they have high energetic needs and they eat all the time. And I suppose, I don't know if your girls, yeah, you, some of you I know watched porpoises before, but when you try to do behavior data, like they're always diving, always foraging. And if you link that with the fact that as you mentioned, Fiona and Helen, they are very common species and they're always around our coast. I think we could also like see it from another angle and see that it's also, they might have quite an important role in the ecosystem. So I suppose anticipating changing purposes might also be a way to anticipate like how it might shape the, the rest of the species. Like, do you have any thoughts on this girl? So have you, have you ever come across about like, I don't know, studies that says how important they are for certain locations or because I, I didn't and I was just wondering right now which is I don't know no no sounds <laughs> no I mean I think you're right they are clearly important for uh, yeah. various ecosystems and I mean you find that with a lot of predators within an ecosystem is they're actually really important for maintaining mm. kind of what's going on ecologically within that system but um yeah I, I haven't come across anything which kind of kind of quantifies yeah. how important they are um it would be interesting I, I don't think of anything either I suppose just the general uh, idea of them being an apex predator mm. and how that trickles down through the food web and stuff like that but yeah. No, yeah, one good. thing I can think of is that, like, like porpoises, I feel like, in my perspective, everything happens really fast with them. So, like, they can bounce back from something really quickly because they can reproduce so quickly. But if, if something affects them, it can also affect their populations very quickly mm. as well. Mm. Uh, and so I was thinking that it's not necessarily, like, quantifying their importance, but I think that they are really good indicators of what's going on. And yeah. so, oh, sorry, it's a little loud. Um, but there has been some work looking at porpoises in the southern North Sea and there with the fish stocks being like the, mm. these large fish being really depleted. You see that animals are eating smaller fish that are of a lower energy content. And uh, they've essentially documented that porpoises may be starving to death even with full stomachs of food because the prey field has changed so much. And so mm. it may be harder to see 
you know, if you are going down and looking at all the different fish, what's going on at yeah. like a higher level, but with the porpoises, you can monitor yeah. them and see how the environment is changing. Yeah. I think the simulations are so cool as well because in the past, that was when you would have um, surveyed areas and looked at the animals and how they're doing to see if there are effects, but it's good to look forward and try to act before there is an effect, you know, so it's really critical really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think that's, if we can get better and better, I feel like we're still, I think, pretty early into being able to do these simulations. And I think porpoises are a really unique species in that we can get so much great data from them that we can make fairly good models to do these predictions. But for a lot of marine mammal species, they're so hard to study that, mm. you know, we don't quite have the access to the same amount of data that we do for porpoises. Yeah. But things that affect porpoises also affect other species. So making these models for them can still be useful as well for helping yeah. other species. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just saw there is another question that came in the chat for Cara. It's from Manuel again, uh, asking, do you have an idea how noise of operating wind turbines impact the porpoises or other marine mammals? And he also says, I might mention before, he also says amazing talk as always and thought it might not be your focus, but I, he asked still. <laughs> yeah, I work with Manu now. So. <laughs> Yeah, um, so the idea is so far, so like evidence as of now suggests that operating wind farms are not necessarily an issue for porpoises. So the, it's really during the development where they're making these very loud noises to do the pile driving that porpoises are really affected by the noise. But then once the wind farms are, whatever, are active, that there is potential for porpoises even to use these areas to like selectively hunt for fish because the, the structures, underwater structures can actually serve as artificial reefs and you can have a bunch of fish around which may make them a potentially good foraging area. Also, a lot of boats are kept outside because they can't come too close to the wind turbines. So maybe vessel traffic's a little lower. So it could be that, you know, an operating wind farm is uh, potentially an easy meal for porpoises, but mm -hmm. while you're developing them, it can be a, a really large disturbance event. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know if you too, Fiona or Helen, if you have any ideas on like impact and operating disturbances versus um, during development on how that's affected uh, porpoises in your area for things like offshore wind farms. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of the work that the Lighthouse Station do, they've got the in the Outer Moray Firth a lot of kind of wind farm construction. And like you said, that initially there's displacement, but then as that kind of work continues and the, the farm becomes operational, the porpoises will come back into the area. But like you said, that initial displacement can be pretty far reaching and that's kind of part of the problem if they're flexible enough to be able to adapt and there's enough of a food source for them to be able to adapt to that as well kind of in other areas but um i guess that's sort of partly understanding kind of how much of an impact different area or how important different areas kind of habitat wise and what are the actual drivers between behind why corpses are where they are will help us in understanding how much of effect that might have as well. So we can actually understand kind of how they're using different habitats and, and things like that. But um, yeah, it's a complex, complex issue, but one we've got to kind of get our heads around because it's only, you know, it's only increasing certainly around Scottish waters. We've just had the big Scott wind um, proposals mm -hmm. all coming in. So it is, um, yeah, an important subject to kind of be looking into at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. I suppose with regards to that, your the data set you're analyzing might be quite powerful, uh, Helen, because if it started a few years ago and these projects are starting to develop more and more now, you might be able to see trends or things like this, like displacements maybe. Yeah, I think there's definitely the potential with kind of long-term data sets like this. And then if they're, these projects are, are continuing to collect data, then you'll be able to look at that kind of into the future as well. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I'm certainly excited to see what comes out of my data because yeah. um, there's a, there's an awful lot there. So I think, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> and I might I might just take 
uh, the occasion while we're on this question to say like the previous episode of Join the Pod, if the viewers are interested, was on the potential impact of marine renewables on marine mammals. So this kind of question that was also like mentioned by the speakers. But for sure, it's something we have to look into it in the future because we all want the energy to be more sustainable. We have to make sure it's okay. I have uh, a question for you, Helen, actually. Um, so I haven't looked at, uh, so I haven't started my acoustic chapters yet, but um, have you looked into whether you can classify any of the communication clicks um, or do you think that's possible yet? Do we know enough yet? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly um, uh, it is possible, I think, but to be honest, it's not um, something that I would like to speak about with any kind of um, pretending like I have too much knowledge about it myself, because I certainly don't. Um, but um, yeah, I would like to think it would be possible, given that there is a kind of a significant difference in repetition rates between those foraging buzzes and communication clicks that... Uh, yeah, I'd like to hope, and I know that there are some people um, working at Colonia with the C quads and F quads that I think are trying to kind of hoping to develop that. So, yeah, I, I think it's something that will be possible, um, and something that I'm certainly going to be looking into as well. So, Fiona, maybe we'll have to keep in touch about that. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I suppose what takes time when you're trying to build these classifiers of behavior is always like having the paired behavior and like visual and acoustic data set because you want to kind of, if you're going to develop the tool that classify them, you want to kind of be sure what, what they were doing. But yeah, sometimes it's hard because it's purposes so <laughs> to see what they are doing. But I think now, like I think some people are also trying to do this re kind of research, like linking the acoustic with footage from drones. And I think it's going to probably really help moving forward because like so far watching from the sea, like you can kind of tell what they're doing, but it's really hard. And also you have to, this is a challenge I came up when I was trying to do it uh, and probably familiar with it, Fiona and, and Helen is like, when you see a purpose, there's no way to tell if the one you see is the one you're listening to. And, and if you're in a high density area, like it's it's very hard to tell. Like I, I hope the one I'm following is the one I'm listening to at the same time. But, so yeah, looking forward to see what the people doing stuff with the drones and acoustics will will develop. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think drones are a really powerful tool in kind of marine mammal research because they kind of offer a view that we don't get otherwise. Um, yeah, and if you can link acoustics and drone footage, then that would be. <laughs> interesting to see what they're doing there was that paper as well where um, they took foraging out of the equation so when they were increasing their acoustic activity at night and it wasn't because of foraging which is often what we say when we see increased acou acoustic activity so I wonder what they're doing <laughs> <laughs> throwing a party of course <laughs> <laughs> yeah and there's that there's a nice study that looked at corpse hunting with porpoises using drone imagery and I think that was really nice because I you know porpoises I think sometimes get the short straw that you know they're not the most kind of gregarious species mm. that interact with boats like bottlenose dolphins do so we make the assumption that they're kind of not that interesting but I think that's just because they don't want to interact with the boat doesn't mean that they don't have this interesting yeah. social structure going on so I think there's an awful lot more to be found out about them mm -hmm. um, so yeah I think it's exciting for sure um just a question came in, coming in from Fiona, from Josephine. Um, I was wondering if those reports for the SACs are publicly available. They are, yeah, I could link them here after. They're all available. Yeah, I think uh, you make a really nice point in your talk, Fiona, about kind of our the monitoring systems for our special areas of conservation or protected areas actually kind of capturing or giving us enough information about what's actually going on with these populations. So I think kind of the more information we can get to try to try and understand what's going on will help us in that monitoring because if a you know, like the Inner Minches and Hebrides SAC that I was talking about, you know, this is a huge area. How many 
pod do you need to be able to effectively monitor a population within that? We don't actually know at the moment. So, mm. yeah, it's, a, it's an important point, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I think for purposes, there were a lot to learn from what was done in, in the Baltic and in the North Sea. It was like they were high density cover like arrays but it's true that when you move like more offshore and like larger areas like then you have to think about what's realistically possible to maintain logistically as well because if you have to deploy them service everything yeah i mean yeah. that samba study was amazing but they yeah. you know 300 pods out within the area and then yeah. to get I don't know how practical that is in like the long term for monitoring SACs because not everywhere will have mm -hmm. the resources to be able to do that kind of thing as much as you would like to. <laughs> yeah. Especially if, especially if we move towards larger SACs or like new kinds of MPAs that might be mobile or seasonal, like this kind of new tools which might be more appropriate. For the species conservation since they move so much but in terms of monitoring it also means we all need to come on, come on the same page and make sure we do the same across i think it's it's going in the right direction like now but it's, it's yeah it's complicated and we are lucky because porpoises like are quite easy to monitor you listen to them you're sure it's them but for any of the other like the dolphin species for example it gets so much harder yeah there's mm. a lot of Kind of mm. working on species classifiers and it would yeah. be great if they all managed to, to make them work because that is definitely a problem with dolphins to yeah. try and classify different species i mean yeah mm. sometimes it seems hard studying corpses but in that case corpses are much yeah. easier <laughs> absolutely yeah okay and also go ahead Morgan. i was going to say it's also easier to kind of develop like this uh, but it's something we mentioned before, like these kind of uh, habitat models or the energetic models that Kara was saying is that we we have good data on porpoises because we have a lot of them. But for any like more rare species, it gets complicated. But it's still nice to develop the tools so that we know they work. And then when we get the information about the other species, just the applying application that's left to do. But then, yeah. half one um i might be biased but i love having an episode all about our harbor oh, yeah. <laughs> this was this was in the making since the start of the webinar yeah. i have to say so i hope that we were able to share our love of the harbor porpoise with our viewers um our next episode is going to be in april uh and it's going to be another research technique focused webinar it's going to be on Friday, the 29th of April, so keep your eyes peeled. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you again, girls, for joining and giving your talks. It was very, very good. And yeah, we're always so lucky. We always have a super interesting presentation. So thank you for making the time and showing every yeah, the preparation meetings and everything. It was lovely working with you. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I might just add if anyone is watching the video later or is just catching up, like you can always ask the questions in the comments and we will try to, yeah, we'll contact the speakers, try to see if we can answer. The video is going to stay up anyway. And yeah, we might mention like the few resources we mentioned during the discussion, we'd like link to them as well. And we we'll see you next month, I suppose. Thank you both. Bye.